good good so hi everybody great to see you and so pleased to welcome the wonderful and talented shannon brown hey shannon hi hi how you promoted Woo. Shannon, for those of you who don't know, Shannon is running an online retreat for women that starts Saturday. Does it start this weekend? It's on Sunday and goes for five days. There's a lot of speakers and 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 opportunities and live sound activation healings and all kinds of things. And you are welcome to, I give you complete permission to sign up and dip in and out. Like, don't think of it as like, oh no, I've got to commit to the whole five days. No, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. The great thing about these online retreats is you can dip your toe in and out. You can, you know, watch while you're doing something else. But I would recommend um, a lot of them have kind of a, a practice the way that Sam just did uh, an experiential. So it's for women who are going through transformation in their lives. It's a, a five-day retreat to support us through creativity, through sensuality, through psychedelics, through meeting other women, energy practices, shamanic healing, organizational skills, uh, getting clear on your vision and your plans for your life. Really recommend that if you're a woman 40 and up, and even if you're younger than 40, but this is particularly a retreat for women 40 Plus, I'd really recommend you you join us. It's it's going to be great. We have so many wonderful speakers, including you, Sam. I loved our talk. Tell the nice people a little bit about like how you got from where you were to where you are. <laughs> I love you because I think there'll be a lot of people who who get what I'm talking about. I've worn many hats. I I seem to be every ten years I reinvent myself, but it's always something creative. And it's always something to do with how we see the world. And, you know, art has always been a big part of my life. My parents were both artists. They met at art college back in the 60s. They didn't stay together, but uh, they went their own way in the arts. So I always had this creative support in my life, which I feel very blessed to have had. And because of that, I've always done something that's educational in the arts or um, supporting people to blossom in their own creativity. So in my 20s, I worked in the film industry. I was doing props and wardrobe styling. Um, I was producing fashion shows. I was having art shows, living in downtown Toronto in a big old artsy warehouse. You know, we just had tons of fun. Then, unfortunately, my mom passed away when I was 30. So I did a total shift. I realized that I... I needed to think about healing in a different way. My mom had worked too hard. She was a uh, really, really in serious burnout. And she just, she, she was very successful, amazing, beautiful woman. Everyone loved what she did, but it, it dawned on me that she, she burned out. So I needed to know what to do in the creative world that can be supportive and healing. So I got interested in art therapy and in expressive arts and basically started going to school. I did a teacher's degree. I brought art to schools, art to children, brought creativity into the world through working at museums and art centers. I was always the one that was organizing, and yet I also was an artist. So I was Somehow, this creative being that I am, I got really good at organizing things. And See, organizing I think there's more out of us out there than people think. Because I think artists in general have this reputation of like, oh, they're super flaky or, oh, they can't figure things out or they love doing the creative process. They're not good at the marketing and the organizing and the back end and the admin. And I'm always like, I'm good at the marketing and the organizing and the back end. I like it. <laughs> but, right? I mean, I first of all, I've always thought that this whole concept of right brain, left brain is a little bit bullshit. I mean, it's an interesting construct. It's an interesting way to think about how we think, but it's yeah. not actually a thing. You know, everybody is both brained, you know, but this idea that one cancels out the other, that you can't have both. My experience with highly creative people is that they are in fact more both brained than everybody else, you know? So we make connections between things more quickly. We see patterns where other people don't necessarily see patterns and we're very quick to innovate. So anyway, totally. for all my brothers and sisters out there who are artsy and good organizers, I just want to say props. Props yeah. to you. Props to you. That's right. That's right. And, and the artistic piece and the creative piece, and I really started getting involved in like learning about Jungian psychology and transpersonal psychology and understanding how the mind works and working with things like active imagination, really diving deep into that world. I started studying more seriously into art therapy, 
But the big piece that opened up for me was the world of plant medicines and psychedelics. As a creative person, I'm curious. And actually one of the things that uh, when people are researching psychedelics is that people are scoring higher on creative creativity after yeah. taking psychedelics. Sure. Because what you talked about where the brain is making new connections, that's inherent in the psychedelic experience. Obviously, when done in a legal setting under, you know, the care of somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, but the brain is is able to make new neural connections, which for creative people is just like, woo! Yeah, we can very, we love a new idea. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Like, give me a new podcast. Give me something new to learn. I want to go back to school. I want to, like, get deep into all this stuff, you know. Even as an artist, for me, it's always been about learning how to see, learning how to really get into something and really get focused and engulfed in it and getting in that flow state, you know? We love the flow state. So tell me, did you ever get or feel sort of um, trapped by that messaging around like, well, you better pick a niche, you know, you got to narrow down, you got to focus on just one thing. Did How did you, how did you manage that? Well, it's that whole thing about jack of all trades, master of none, right? Luckily, when I turned 30, after my mom passed away, I met this fantastic man. We ended up being partners for 21 years. And he's like me. He's also a highly creative person. We have kind of a, a wild life. <laughs> But it's it's really suited both of us. And I remember saying that to him at one time, and he just was like, that is an old idea that really only served the industrial revolution when we were in this um, you know, factory model of being, because you needed to be in one track, be very focused in one track, and just stay in that track in order to get the car built or the, you know, the clock ticking or whatever it was that you were put onto. Whereas we actually are through evolution, we have had to be multi-talented and multi-focused in our ways of being as humans. That's the only way we could be. Now we do have our own special skills right. and special ways of doing things. And some people are more interested in, you know, I want to be the one who goes and fixes people's bones. I don't want to do that. I want to be the one who, you know, can create a beautiful space and bring the community together for a celebration. But the doctor who fixes bones doesn't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. But it doesn't mean that we can't do multiple things and really blossom in in these areas that we're good at. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I agree with you. The jack of all trades, master of none. That can go right out there along with the phrase starving artist. Like, yeah, bye bye. Who came up with that? I artists don't starve. I never starved. Okay, I lived on beans and rice for a long time, but I wasn't starving. <laughs> we're starving. Yeah, that was more. That was more my lack of vision for myself and sort of a lack of prosperity mindset than it was the fact that I wasn't incapable of earning. So cross these off your list, and if you have anybody in your life who likes to repeat these sort of things, just stand up to them a little bit. Be like, no, I'm master of all things, and I don't know who Jack is. Like, mm -mm. yeah, mm -mm. Jack's gone. We can Jack's gone. Out. Jack's Jack's <laughs> Jack's hit the road. Hit the road, Jack. We and we are in fact not starving artists, but prosperous artists. Yeah. Shirley says that's part of my problem. Too many choices. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And, and Sam, I'm sure you have talked um, in many of your podcasts and books about that because there can be those moments when you feel a bit overwhelmed, like, what do I do first? Where do I go first? How do I monetize what I'm doing? All these passions, you know, and I'm still figuring that out. I mean, I'm still, because I'm still doing multiple things, but it all ends up working somehow. I wish I had a formula for it. And I think trusting yourself, knowing that you're on the right path, whether it's that I'm, I'm sitting here lost, well, then that's okay. That's part of the path, actually, to sit back and just be in that spot. We don't always have to be doing and achieving. Sometimes it's just about sitting back and relaxing and learning how to be the, that person who can kind of take it in and synthesize. And just showing up in total faith that you're on the path and that what's necessary will appear. And and because it always does, it always does. I had a big, I really started my business. Um, you know, I was living and working in LA mostly as an actor, but that meant that I had a whole nother bunch of jobs and gigs and things to support me financially. And I started to notice that they, I'd started teaching the get it done workshop, like twice a year in a church basement. And I was doing some 
copywriting, actually marketing writing for some arts organizations, for some nonprofits, like helping them fundraising letters and grant applications and stuff like that. And then I had some friends who were asking me to do like home and office organization stuff with them, like helping them clear out their closets. And I kind of liked that. I was pretty good at it. I remember thinking like that I really needed a new gig and what was I going to do? And I was, I was in the shower just so often, you know, <laughs> your mind waits for you to be sort of calm and relaxed before it's like, here's your idea. <laughs> so yeah. that's right in the shower or while you're out for a walk, while you're on a long drive, sometimes when I'm chopping vegetables, like ding, here's your big yeah. idea. So I'm in the shower, ding, here's your big idea. And I thought, oh, well, I bet if I called it the organized artist company, like that could be like an umbrella and I could do all these things sort of as each as an arm, like a little spoke on the umbrella. Amazing. Like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's beautiful. So I encourage all of you, if you feel like, oh no, I'm a kindergarten teacher and I'm a massage therapist and I want to do color analysis for people. Like, how can you umbrella that? Because it's still you in all of these scenarios and your creative self is not any less of an artist when you're teaching young children, probably more of an artist when you're teaching young children, you know, or when you're at your admin job or when you're, you know, you bring your creativity and your whole self wherever you go. So what is that? You know, what is that umbrella and how do you want to call it? Cause then everybody else gets more comfortable. If they don't know what to call you, they get a little, they, it freaks them out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. They say, oh, this is Shannon. She's an artist and a healer. Now we know that covers like a planet of skills and talents and abilities and services, but at least it gives people a file folder to put you in. Right. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it is, is just giving yourself the permission to lock into something and it doesn't have to be one thing. I'm always giving myself, um, you know, this permission to be multitude of things. And, and your umbrella analogy is great. I also had the analogy of a flower arrangement, you know, every, oh. all the different things I do are the different flowers, but you put the flowers together. And if they're arranged in a way that's really, you know, a beautiful composition and they're working together, then I'm the flower arrangement. That's a similar idea. And I found also that putting myself into a website was really good because then I could call my website one thing and then have like multiple tabs of the different things you can do. Yeah. And don't let that story of, oh, people are going to get confused by who you are and what you are and what you do. Just, just throw that out the door, put it up and then refine it. And it'll all start to, to work together like a delicious meal that you cook, you know? Life would be so boring if we were just one thing or if we just ate one thing or if we just had one flower. I, I want to have all the flowers. I love that idea of complementary skill sets making a beautiful flower display. That's really beautiful. And you don't have to know where you're going before you get there. I mean, like I said, this is where I started with this idea in the shower. And I maybe did the home and office organization thing for like six or eight months and not that much before I was like this yeah. isn't really for me I don't really love this there's a lot of people who are way way better at it than I am and people are nuts when it comes to their stuff they're crazy they seem like perfectly normal people and then you start like well perhaps we could get rid of this pen oh no not that pen <laughs> not that pen I'm like, oh, okay <laughs> so, you know, like I realized I'd much rather help people organize the inside of their brains than the inside of their closets. So yeah. um, and they're also to, like, connected, right? Yeah. Oh, totally. Right. Exactly. So I like to like let that part go, but yeah, but I didn't know that when I started and we get attached to being right, right. We want to be right. We want to be seen mm -hmm. to be right. We want to get an A plus. We want to be seen to get an A plus. I was just <laughs> the doctors yesterday. And <laughs> I was afterwards, I was like talking to my sister and I was like, yeah, well, I was really trying to get an A plus at being at the doctor. <laughs> I want to be good at this. I want to be the best little patient ever. <laughs> we want to be good. We want to be right. We want to be good. We want to be yeah. right. When there is no pathway, and then there is no accepted pathway to really not just trust your inner voice, but also trust your own behavior. I mean, this, because yeah. I kept thinking that the whole time I was thinking about growing this organi organizing business, like, oh, I should join the National Association of Organizers. I should go to their event in Las Vegas. I should network with other organizers. I should, 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 should. Never did any of it. Yeah. And finally I was like, maybe the fact that I'm not doing it is my sign that I really shouldn't be doing it. And some people don't even get to the point where they do it. They hold themselves back. 
and they don't even try it. So they can't even go through the process Mm -hmm. and they get to the other side and say, oh, I didn't like it. Give yourself a chance. You know, maybe you have a job job and maybe this is something you want to do on the side. Well, give it a chance. I know some of the fear is having the external world reflect back on us and say, I never really know what you're doing. Cause I've had this before. I've had friends say, you know, one friend tells another friend who tells you, well, that friend said she can never really understand who you are, who, what you're doing. It's like, well, that's the way her mind works. She needs to have that sensation of like, I know where that person is and what they're doing. And I'm going to put them over here and everything will be okay, but that's not me. So sometimes we might need to rethink some friendships if it's not working or, you know, if we, if we have that conversation, well, this is how I am. And how, how does that affect you or whatever? And maybe it means I'm evolving and, and that's okay too. So don't let that hold you back. June says, how lovely that people can't put you in a box. Yeah. And you know, some people get very, like you say, some people get very touchy, but they're like, I don't know what she does. It confuses me. That's fine. Just call, say, uh, just tell people I'm a teacher. That's fine. Just tell them I'm a teacher. It's fine. Nobody cares. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <You know? exactly. laughs> and really remembering that even people who seem like they're kind of stuffy and in a box probably aren't. Mm-hmm. I remember having a conversation with a banker one time. I was trying to get a loan from this bank, which I ended up not getting. But uh, I'm chit-chatting with the bank manager and he's, it's, you know, in Montecito, California. It's all very pulled up and fancy. We're talking and, as I, and I'm telling him about my business. And he's really? Oh, tell me more about this. And oh, what are your books about? And, oh, so we chat for a while. And then finally, Mr. Buttoned Up Blue Blazer Bank Manager Man goes, you know, what I really love to do is go on beach watch with my wife and we find the sea glass and then I make jewelry out of it. I'm like, you make sea glass jewelry? (laughs) Yes. All the things. I I love it. Years would have guessed this. And then he was all like, you know, and then he was like, we were talking about And then he, and then he was like, well, hey, listen, I run the, I'm in the speak, charge of the speakers program at the Rotary. You want to come speak at the Rotary? I'm like, sure. He's like, we do it up at the Montecito Country Club. It's a very nice lunch. I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get the loan. I didn't get the loan, but I made a new friend and I got a nice, and I got a new speaking gig. So that worked. Look for the oh. opportunities. They're everywhere. And for those of us who hate small talk, which most highly creative people do, absolutely allergic to small talk. This yeah. question, so what do you do when you're not working? What do you love to do? What if somebody woke you up at three in the morning and said, hey, 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 we're going to go do da-da-da. You would be like, oh yeah, where are my shoes? I'm in. And people will start telling you about their fly tying or their wine tasting, their plant medicine journey in Costa Rica. Like they'll tell you the most amazing things about themselves. It's really fun. I'm a Gemini as well. So I'm really good with like being multiple people. I truly see that everywhere. There's, there's often people with, this is me on this day. And then this is me on that day. I think it's, it's great for us to move towards integrating all the parts and, and like coming out and being that true person, but being a multiple personality is also okay. And having all these different passions, again, it's fine. You don't have to do the one thing. That's, that's like your banker is an exact example of that. Lori says, I love that. What do you like to do in your spare time? Yeah. Americans are infamous the world over for always saying right away. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do for a living? What's your business? What do you do? The rest of the world, certainly the rest of Europe is like, that's so tacky. Like, <laughs> I like to don't... say what inspires you, you know, what inspires you? Yeah. what inspires you, what gets you turned on, what keeps you awake at night thinking about exciting things. Okay. Well, maybe not that, but <laughs> <laughs> You can get some answers to my number. <laughs> Part of me wants to ask about the summit because I know that putting together an event like that is just a massive amount of, of work. I've done it. And it's, it's, yeah. I had a lot of help and it was still a lot of work. Um, yeah. It's interesting. The woman that I'm doing this with, she's supporting me. She's done many of them. And so she's kind of coaching me through it. She's like, wow, you're really good at this. I'm like, well, actually I was a film producer for 10 years. And then I worked at a academic art museum setting up educational programming for schools and tours. And, and she's like, oh, wow. Because in her mind, again, it was like, Shannon's a creative being. She's a healer. All these things that I am. So seeing you as one thing, and then all of a sudden this other side comes out. I'm like, <clears throat> I can do all that. And I'm good at it. But it's been hard because part of me has wanted to, for years, just wanted to leave the kind of organizational producing putting other artists on the stage kind of world and say, Hey, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm a healer. I'm ready to do this work. There seemed to be this big dichotomy between them. I realized 
one day uh, had had a, you know, one of those moments where you just see it all. And I really saw myself as a woman with a foot in two worlds mm. in that creative world and in that ability to be dreamy and floaty and creative. And, you know, that's my happy place, really. It truly is. But then also have all these other skills. And when I would used to work with artists, I'd say, okay, can you send me an invoice? And they'd be like, what's an invoice? You know, <laughs> I was teaching artists how to do all that stuff too. And having both, it's such a benefit. It's such a beautiful thing. It really is. We're going back to what we said at the beginning, but it was really seeing myself as a woman with a foot in two worlds. Cause we can, we can do that. We can be dreamy and creative. I look at it as a square in a circle. Mm square in a circle. The circle is the dreamy and the square is the structure. Shirley asks, question about the retreat. Will the sessions be available later, signed up, but not going to be able to join much? Yes, absolutely. So each day, there's five days. We have three speakers on each day. You'll be able to watch for another 48 hours. And if you do buy the upgrade, which is $37, then you get limited lifetime uh, viewing. Um, you also get a half hour coaching call with me. Um, you get uh, a couple other goodies. So sign up for that. And yeah, love to see you there. Are you on the Facebook page as well? Cause there's a great Facebook group. We've got a lot going on in the Facebook group. Oh, good. That's good to know to hop over to that one. Here's the other thing too, that nobody really talks about, at least in entrepreneurship. I don't know what big businesses do, but I end up re-examining sort of like, what am I offering? What am I really doing? Who am I really trying to serve? What's really most effective? What's going to bring in the most money, the easiest? What's, you know, what's going to do the most good, the fastest? Like um, revisiting these questions at least once a year, certainly once every two years, just kind of go like, is all this still vibing with me? And does the brand need a refresh? Am I happy with these colors? You know, all that opportunity is to tack sort of as you're sailing along, you're not locked in forever. And one of the bigger changes we made was re not rebranding, but shifting the, the name of the website to therealsambennett.com, which made me feel extremely shy. Veronica will tell you the last thing I wanted was it to be for it to be my name and my face, like <laughs> yeah. right there front and center hi everybody um because like a lot of people you know i got visibility issues even as an actor people think but aren't you an actor yes <laughs> but that's that actor, character i'm that someone character. else yeah exactly. so this idea of putting myself out as a thought leader and a person and a teacher was unnerving but i didn't wait to feel comfortable to do it if you feel ready you've waited too long so well, that's where all the learning happens, right? When we're in that uncomfortable place where we we know there's something we need to do and we just do it because then you learn, then you figure it out. If you just sit back and wait, life is just going to float on by. It really will. And today's the day. My mom used to say, today is the first day of the rest of your life. That's right. Let's wake up in the morning. Today's the first day of the rest of my life. It's time. I'm ready to go. That's exactly right. Uh, Rebecca asks, do you think roles can still be combined under one umbrella when one of the roles is something a bit more rigid as a profession, i.g. licensed therapist, et cetera? That's an interesting question because there are definitely professions where you are very limited about what you can say and do to market yourself and what you can say and do outside of that. My sister works in social services and I was saying to her like, oh, you should be on more podcasts. She's got some really wonderful innovative stuff she's doing with the state of Connecticut and their social services programs. And I'm like, this is so interesting. And she's speaking at events with other people in her profession, but I'm like, you should be on one of the more popular podcasts because a lot of this is really interesting stuff. And she's like, I would need to get permission from the government. I would need to get permission from DCFS. I would need to have vetted by media services. Like she's got a lot of restrictions on what she can and cannot do. Yeah. So you're right. For some people, it's not, that's the umbrella thing is going to get a little sketchy. It's happening actually um, in the psychedelic world for sure, because- mm -hmm you know, the fact that it's becoming legalized and decriminalized in many, many places around the world because science is backing it up and science is saying, well, then if that's the case, then we need to have licensed professionals who are, you know, creating these experiences and, and serving the medicines to people. There's obviously incredible benefits in that, but then you have these people who've been doing this work for you know, many, many, many years, 20, 30, 40, hundreds of years, indigenous folks and that sort of thing that really have the deep spiritual understandings of these medicines. So how does one with a license still work in that way and not have to have it 
cost an arm and a leg for the general public and that sort of thing. So there, there's definitely some, some challenging ground that's being worked out right now. One of our guests on, uh, on the retreat, her name is Alison Crossway. She used oh. to be a licensed psychotherapist and really wanted to work with psychedelics. She had an ayahuasca experience. It, it changed her whole life. She realized this is where I want to be. So she's actually given up her license. So she has the skills and knowledge of a psychotherapist who's, who had done that work for years. And she was also a New York um, Wall Street banker at one time. There may be those sorts of questions. It depends what you want to do with your time. And if, is it worth it to let go of the license? Or as things are changing and the world is changing so much, maybe there will be moments that we can be in the spotlight and still have job jobs seeing us in those places, but be able to speak our truth, be able to stand in in the power of of what our soul's calling us to do. Yeah. I've also certainly had clients who felt like, gosh, I'm trained in this or I've had a career doing this and now I want to do this. And they're so, you know, they're like, and then and I always get that image of, do you guys play with this when your kids, those pigs with magnets? It's not really a game, but they they sort of repel each other and then you turn them around and they go click like that. It's silly. Anyway, I would talk about those, <laughs> these little magnetic pigs. So often these two things that seem in your own mind to be so separate and like, oh, never the twain could meet actually go beautifully together. I remember a woman who had been a lawyer, but she was really interested in becoming a life coach. But the idea of giving up this lucrative and, and prestigious, you know, world of being a lawyer to become a life coach was a little weird to her. And I was like, why don't you be a lawyer for life coaches? Because God knows they need it. And right. no one understands the life coaching industry. I mean, most lawyers, if you take a, they take a look at life coaching contracts, we used to have them too. And they go, no, what? No. <laughs> so to be a lawyer for life coaches could be great or be a life coach for lawyers. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. You know, like say, Hey, look, I know your world. I know what you're struggling with. I've added to my skills with this, these additional skill sets to help you get focused on what you want to do. So Rebecca, there may be things like that where, you know, you want to open a children's library, but you've been a licensed therapist. You're still bringing your skill sets as a licensed therapist with you. And you can say all that, you know, as a practicing clinician or as a former therapist or as a whatever, and still carry that. I, I worked with a woman who was in a pharmaceutical, she was a pharmacist uh, at, a, at, a, at a hospital and, and had a particular specialty in that. Um, but she was also a Reiki master and was teaching and training Reiki. And she sort of had that like feeling of like, mm, these are two very different things. And I'm like, mm, no, it's all medicine. And I'm like, I'll tell you what, if you can get a headshot or a picture taken of you in your pharmacist coat, I'm like, just one, like it doesn't have to be the main photo or whatever, but like these little authority signs of like, well, they went to Stanford. Well, she's got a degree. Well, she's, a th you know, those things matter to people who want to give you money. It's, and I always yeah. think of it as, as like, it's what the person who's going to hire you is going to say to their spouse or partner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you know? Did you she know? Was a pharmacist. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It gives a little, you know, a little solid ground underneath there. That's how I see it. Right. What's in your toolbox? Mm -hmm. I'm bringing this pretty solid toolbox. And so are you. And so are many of us on here. We've got this great toolbox. Let's see it as a, as a positive, not something that is, it can come across as being confusing and make us feel like we don't know who we are or what we do. But again, it's that umbrella, put it in the toolbox, put it in the website, put it all together in this beautiful, you know, menu. And it starts to bloom. It's our personal medicine. It's what we bring to the world, yeah. right? We're not, we're, we're very similar, but we're also original. And we bring such incredible fingerprints to the world of, of this magic that we each carry. And, and there are people in the world who want that. There are people that vibrate with me and people that vibrate with you and people that want to want to sync up because they've got the same kind of stuff going on. Exactly. My family teases me constantly because it's a running joke that I can't resist a sample platter. If there's a sample platter on the menu, I, I'm in. That's what I'm getting. Because yeah. I don't want to have just one thing. I want to, have, I want to try I it all. Get, I want to try it all. And I can't get, if something is just one thing, I can't get interested. Something has to be at least two things for me to get yeah. interested, right? But here's how you can, here's a really quick way to tell if you are overcomplicating or not. Because here's the other thing with us multi hyphenates is we will overcomplicate paper bag, like everything. So when you are telling people what you do, 
or how you do it when you're answering that question. If their eyebrows go up, that's a good sign. That means they're interested. Even if they don't, even if they're saying like, wow, I'm not really sure what that is, but you know, they're still interested, right? If their eyebrows go like this, it means they don't understand what you're saying. Or one goes up and one goes down. Right. <laughs> if you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a quick way to like, just try it out, try it out in your dry cleaners, try it out on people, you know, at the, when you're waiting for the kids pick up or whatever, and just start to see what, what happens when you say, well, I'm a this and I'm a this and I do this, you know, you know, I help these kinds of people get these kind of results. See, see what happens with their eyes. Cause again, if it goes up, you're good. If it goes wrong, then you've overcomplicated, you've, you're not being clear. Um, I love the elevator pitch idea. Yeah. And I really recommend that to people come up with your elevator pitch. So if you don't know what that is, it's imagine you're going into an elevator and the person that you really, really want to talk to, who's got the, you know, he's the bank loan guy. Uh, he's in the elevator with you and you have, you know, just under a minute to pitch your idea and then they're going to get off. So come up with the elevator pitch, practice it, film yourself, go in front of the mirror, get it timed, get it down. Remember, rehearse. So when those opportunities come up, you got this, you know, you, you got it. And sometimes it's harder for people to understand how they can fit with you. When you say, I am a art therapist, I am an art teacher, I am a da, 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 then they're like, oh, that's interesting. But if you say, I work with women who are going through transformation and I use sound art and plant medicine, oh, then a person can say, oh yeah, that's for me. Or, oh no, that's not for me, but that's for my wife or my sister to make that link. Mm -hmm. I always like to say, to talk about the problem that you solve first. Yes. Somebody said, so Sam, what do you do? And I'd say, oh my gosh. Okay. You know, I love this example. You know how every time you got to sushi, you somehow are wearing a white blouse and you somehow get soy sauce right exactly on your white blouse. And everybody goes, yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. I'm a dry cleaner. I get stains out of delicate fabrics. Oh, cool. I've thought you know, right. So we talk about the problem first. So they're yeah. connected with it and their experience. And then you say what the actual thing is. So people say, what do you do? And I say, well, you know how you get everything done for everybody else all day, but the stuff that really matters to you kind of stays in a drawer and they go, yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's what I do. I help people get to work on what matters to them, preferably in 15 minutes a day. Yeah. Right? Then people can link in. It's also a story. It's, it's like you're creating it's sensory. You can see the person's mind go, Oh, I've done that. My life is like that. I do that with the things. And once they're in it, they're like, oh, then she's got a solution. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Beautiful. People, we love stories. We love stories. And then you can also calibrate it a little bit because it may be that the person you're in the elevator with is the person who could give you a billion dollar investment. It could be that the person you're in the elevator with is a peer that you would love to get to know better or partner with, or the person is a potential client. And you're going to want to talk about what you do in slightly different ways for each of those people. It's always the, the reason elevator pitches have such a bad rap is because when it sounds canned or rehearsed, we're all like, oh, they're not talking to me anymore. They're just running their tape. Okay. Yeah. Right. And what we really want is, is engagement, right? Yeah. yeah. So practice it, but also practice it with another human being too, so that they can really, you know, did you feel that you can see their eyebrows, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> June says, or if their eyes glaze over or if they start reaching for their phone. Yeah, those are also a good sign. Yeah. And just saying, my name is Enjo Tufts. I don't want to just use my name because searches turn up thousands of Tufts University references. And Veronica responded that it's true. There's a pro hockey player named Sam Bennett that comes up constantly in searches for me. It's it's not that big a deal. People can figure it out. But you don't have to use your name. You can you can figure out something else. Just decide. Don't don't let yourself over think too much about this yeah don't let that hold you back Deborah says the power of difference that's right swatches are fabulous yep yeah giving people little samples of of what you of what you do and how you do it that's great good well we've gone a little usually these are only half an hour but since we had a special guest i wanted to go a little longer is there anything you guys are thinking about or concerned about or want to ask shannon or want to ask me anything that's sort of niggling at you or tapping on your shoulder like oh I don't really want to ask, but I think I need to, uh, that's, that's, that's it. That's your, that's your intuition. That's your spirit guide. That's divine wisdom yeah. saying, knocking say on the door, thing. say the thing, say the thing, ask the thing. My lips are starting to move, but I'm afraid to say anything. 
Yeah, yeah, I really, I get so angry with the educational system sometimes because I feel like they really, we all somehow learned that like, that there is such a thing as a dumb question as much as they ask, oh, there's no dumb questions. Uh, yeah, there are. <laughs> and we've all been the one who asked it. <laughs> Not everybody else go. Oh. Uh, and that, and in fact, that, you, that, that questions are, yes, that somehow questions are to be disapproved of. Um, when does the tr retreat begin? Sunday? Sunday, yeah. So if you sign up now, which I think Sam put a link, mm -hmm. um, you'll be getting an email. Uh, all of the speakers are on the first day start at 8 a.m. So they're pre-recorded and you can access them for 48 hours. Um, and yeah, it's it, it's going to be really great. So I, I'm excited that that some of your peeps are going to be joining us, Sam. This is Me great. Me too. And, I, and I'm especially excited for this retreat because I, I like it that all of them have a practice that it's not just here, let me talk about what I do, but there's all that each of your teachers has an actual thing that you can do and experience while in the, in the course of their teaching. Exactly. Yeah. And that again, brings people into their bodies and that a, lo a lot of what we're talking about is the somatic experience yeah. and, you know, listening to our bodies and being present and being in the moment and allowing ourselves to just be in this experience through breath, through tuning into our, our bodies, our chakras, um, you know, uh, we talk a bit about Tantra and Tantra isn't always just a sexual thing. Tantra really is a practice of how to be present in life. Um, Dee Dassault, who comes from LA, she talks about this idea of, you know, in the morning when you're grinding your coffee or you're just about to drink your coffee, take a moment, just sniff it, activate your senses. Yeah. You know, just take that moment and like, mm, that smells amazing. And that's going to just set your day off in a different way. When we're running through life and not focusing on just the here and now we're like our mind is over here and over there which can which can happen you know when we sure. don't have our practice down when we're not like taking our time in the mornings or in the evenings to really ground um it's so important to just to do that to be rather than do to yes. be not do do be do be do <laughs> be and then do a bit but to be to be yeah I always, um, uh, I put lotion on my whole self every, uh, every morning out of the shower and I've, I've started doing this, God, probably 40 years ago. I say a little blessing over each part of my body as I, I do it like, oh, my arms that are go so good for hugging and my legs that move me in the right direction and my feet that keep me on the ground or know the path. Like I'll make up, you know, sometimes I have sort of a rote one that I do, but sometimes I'll make up new ones and, you know, it's my amazing. belly it's so fun. And it just takes, again, something that's kind of an otherwise an ordinary little moment and brings just a little bit of sacredness to it. And I'm not super special about it. There's no candle lit. There's no, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just putting a lotion. Yeah. But it makes it a little special. So Yeah. Yeah. And I think sometimes we hold ourselves back because we think it should be a certain way. We should have the candle and light the incense and, you know, dim the lights and it has to be a big thing, which is good every once in a while to have those ceremonial moments but to bring that sacredness into our day in these, these different ways. Somebody used to tell me that um, they would say to their kids, it's time for your ablutions. And I was like, what's that word ablution? So I looked it up and it's like the things that we do as a ritual every day to our body. So it's brushing our teeth, washing our face, putting cream on. And there's actually a sacred ceremonial aspect to it, a ritualistic aspect to it. So yeah. So people out there, you know, what, what in your life can you bring a sort of sacred um, lens to a sacred focus to? That's great. Uh, Julie's wondering what time zone you're in or you're broadcasting in. Yeah. So I'm broadcasting um, the Toronto time zone, which is Eastern time. I'm, I was just in Mexico where we had Eastern time that stayed the same time, but here it switches back and forth. So it's, Eastern, I know, Eastern Daylight Time. So it's EDT. And uh, yeah, just look it up, Toronto um, time zone. That's yeah, right. My, my mother time. lives in central Mexico and we have this problem too. And then there's my friends in Arizona who are sometimes on Pacific time and sometimes on mountain time. So. <laughs> okay. No. okay, so yeah, you'll get it. It'll all be in the email. It'll all, the time zones will all be there. If you have any trouble, go to worldtimebuddy.com. 
worldtimebuddy.com. That to me is the best time zone calculator because it's the easiest nice. to use. Um, and Joe has signed up. Good girl. Edith thank says, thank you for the conversation. I'm grappling with the gap between my training and experience in physics and education and what I'm doing now, family caregiver. My dad just turned 99. Wow. Well, blessings on you on your dad, Edith. That's exciting. To, And you're right. You have been initiated into a new chapter and but you can absolutely bring all of your training and all of your experience and all of your wisdom into this new way of being and probably help a lot of other people who are also, you know, we just lost my dad last year and it was, you know, it's, a, it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. So. Lots of people going through transformation. Uh, the women that are coming to this retreat, they're all going through some sort of transformation, a career change, a relationship change, menopause, uh, children leaving the nest, um, parents passing away or going into homes. Um, you know, there's so much that happens. So having this, this community of women to come together and talk about how we can do this well and how we can support each other and how we can really rise, you know, and evolve in these situations. Because when we are going through hard times, that's when the light's getting through, you know, that's when we're we're becoming more, we're learning more about ourselves. We're, we're exploring life in a new way. And when we're having challenges, it's, it's a good time to, to renew yourself and to learn new ways of being. I really love that you're doing this, Shannon, because I just, I was just having a conversation with somebody at the doctor's office, actually, uh, a woman who was saying that her sister is 50. Her husband has just decided that he wants a divorce. She felt really blindsided by the whole thing she's not sure and all of a sudden she's, she just feels like her whole world is kind of rocked and I said if it's any consolation to your sister <laughs> you can tell her that almost all the women I know at the age of 50 are like what is going on and I feel like we need to sort of put some kind of framework in the same way that we do around people getting you know graduating from high school or getting married and we say like oh this is such a special time right you're going through this transition you're going through this transformation this is, this is a common experience for something, someone your age, and you may do it a little earlier, a little later, but this is very normal. And to have these kind of anxieties or these kinds of excitements or experiences, very typical for this place and time. And just because we've, there's so little storytelling about women in their fifties, we all sort of feel like we have to paddle this canoe our by all set ourselves. So to be in community with people like Shannon and the people in her retreat, and like she said, that Facebook page, to just be able to go like, are you feeling this way? Because I'm feeling this way. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. There's, it's happening. And, and as you said, there, there are, there are guidebooks when we're younger. It, it, it's like, you just right. kind of know what to do, right? It, it's a little more directed. And also our hormones direct us, you know, the, the people who choose to have kids, it's like, that's what you do. And you stay and you take care of them and you, you know, everything gets lined up for that. But when you hit menopause, you know, in your late forties, even perimenopause, there is no guidebook or there was, and we lost it. And it was taken away from us as we were, you know, put in our little boxes next door to each other and not communicating. So now is the time for people to start bringing these things back, you know, it is one of the most powerful times for women. Yeah. And with menopause in multiple cultures, women are given ceremonies for this time. It's not demonized or, or seen as something like embarrassing or, you know, oh, she's got menopausal rage. Let's like put her in the house and not talk to her anymore. No, it's like, we want to be heard now. It's finally time. That's right. That's yeah. right. So much. Um, yeah. June says she's signing up too. Excellent. Julie says, yeah, she hears that about the elder caregiving, right? Exactly. Uh, NK says, I will be touring in Africa with a documentary that I co-produced during that time as a child of fracture. I would like to explore microdosing. Any other guidance on that? Also hiring a PR person to help with branding for myself in relation to the film. Any advice there on resources? I bet that's the kind of question you could put to Shannon in her Facebook page and yes, get please. a little Absolutely. more direct guidance because it's a little specific for our purposes of our conversation right here. It's a little outside the scope of what we're talking about, but and there's uh, lots of support out there. So just please reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the retreat. Best of luck with it. I'm sure it's going to be a big hit and uh, y'all feel free to share that link with anybody, you know, who might like it or love it or whatever. That's an affiliate link, by the way. So if you buy Shannon's $37 upgrade. She might have to buy me a glass of wine sometime. Love um, that. Yes. 
So. Great. So let's do one more breath to close out the circle. Veronica, as always, thank you so much for being here. And you ready, everybody? Let's inhale. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. <sighs> Exhale. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. Thanks for doing this with me. Thank you, Bye. Sam. It's so great. Bye, My everyone. pleasure. Great to see you, dear. <laughs>